started here. Uh, the meeting, this meeting is being recorded just for everyone's reference. Uh, ben, Steve, or Tom, does anyone from the DRBA want to kind of, if there's any remarks you want to make or we can get started? Sure. Um, this is this is Steve Williams, and uh, uh, thank everyone. Welcome everyone uh, to the uh, Delaware Park Master Plan uh, meeting. And just a, a, a few quick comments about about what we've done here and what the process involves. Really, um, the master plan, while it's a re the, the document itself is not required, the outcome of this one of the outcomes of this process will be an airport layout plan that defines uh, the future ultimate build out of the airport. What the what will the airport look like uh, down the road? Uh, Twenty year look ahead, what the airport will, will be, uh, what the airport could be. So. We, um, we go through this process. We try to have as much input. It's a very iterative process that the FAA um, looks at uh, from a forecast perspective. We look at a lot of an economic impact uh, issues, economic issues related to the local area, related to aircraft type. And so this this process that we go through every couple of years uh, at this at this airport um, is going to define its future, going to help define its future. Back in 2000, when the DRVA took took over the operation of Delaware Air Park, um, it was a it was a much smaller, um, much more a much different facility, and we've seen its growth uh, to opening a new, the opening of a new 4,200 foot runway, and um, we're looking at what will the future look like for the Delaware Air Park. And so you've been involved in this process. Those of you that are either users, tenants, or other kinds of stakeholders. Uh, your input into this process is really valued and um, uh, we look forward to the outcome we look forward to uh, a document and um, a final outcome of this process um, tom cook our executive director would you like to say anything i, I think steve you, you said it well uh, you know th this is the opportunity for the our stakeholders to set the path for for the delaware airport and its future um, you know, I, I think that's what this is about, is really having that interaction and understanding, um, you know, what's on people's minds, what their vision is, and matching that up with uh, with our vision to have something that's a, a successful asset in Kent County. So I look forward to uh, to this, this meeting tonight and uh, the, the final product. Thank you, okay. Tom. All right, Rick. All right, can everyone here. see the screen uh, with the PowerPoint? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, I, I will ask everyone, please mute yourselves um, unless you have a question, then you can unmute and we can take questions as we go. Uh, and then at the end. So just for everyone's reference, this is the public meeting component of the master plan. Normally, this is the type of meeting where there's an open house workshop where you see boards and easels and stations where you can come in and it's an open house and ask questions. Um, unfortunately, due to public health concerns, we're not able to meet in person. I, I wish we uh, was there with you all, uh, but we are using a virtual component to to satisfy the need to get public input and to share this information with the general public. So with that, we'll get started. So today we're going to talk about just the master plan process, inventory, forecast, environmental overview, facility requirements, the alternatives, and the implementation. These are the different pieces of a master plan. Um, so what is the master plan? Uh, master plan is the, the official planning document for both the FA and DELDOT. What it essentially means is that if you're going to go to ask for state or federal money, they want to know that you've thought it through and that it is justified and makes sense in order for them to give the funding. So they, what they want is they want a plan, uh, which is the airport layout plan that Steve referenced. So if, if a project is on your airport layout plan, then it is eligible for federal funding. And it reflects the sponsor's goals and visions for the airport as both Steve and Tom alluded to. And it really covers about the next 10 to 20 years. These, are, these studies are typically updated by every 10, 15 years or so for an airport of this size. Uh, but it's important to note that just because a project is on the plan does not mean that it's automatically guaranteed funding. It is subject to different funding approval 
and most projects will require some sort of environmental approval as well. So again, the process, which is the inventory environmental overview, that's figuring out what we have, what our, what our existing conditions are. Uh, the forecast and facility requirements tell us where we're going and what we need. And the alternatives and financial implementation plan is how can we achieve these goals and how do we pay for it? So going into the inventory, this is the a high level overview of the airport facility. Uh, you may hear me use some acronyms, so if something is not clear, please just let me know. Uh, but generally speaking, the entire airport, as most people know, has essentially been uh, rebuilt over the past uh, 10 to 15 years with a new runway that is uh, 4,200 feet by 75 feet. That runway is basically capable of accommodating anything from a, a small and medium sized business jet and smaller. So you have single engine airplanes like what you see um, DSU use with their, their flight training program, uh, King Airs and small business jets from the, uh, when there's a race in town, you may see several business jets using the airport and those medium sized planes will, will use the airport on a semi regular basis. So in terms of uh, other facilities, it, there's non precision approaches. What that means is that there's GPS guidance available uh, to, to guide pilots into the runway. And the pavement strength is commensurate with the size of business jets that have the ability to use this airport. So that, is, that is the runway. Um, on the air side overview, again, the uh, runway 927, 4,000 feet long, there are the GPS approaches to both ends. Uh, and there is a communication system that is, allows the pilots to talk to one another because it's not a controlled tower airport. Uh, and important to note that there is a full parallel taxiway which means you, uh, you're allowed to taxi from end to end on to, and without having to access the runway in order to taxi to the end of the runway. So that's a, a big improvement from the previous uh, facility. On the land side, um, what, you see, what you see here is the terminal building shared by Delaware State with their maintenance program, their classrooms, and also acts as the fixed base operator, which is kind of the the service station essentially for itinerant aircraft that are coming in that are not based here. There is a 5,000 gallon uh, 100 low lead avgas tank, auto parking, and there are several T hangers located on uh, the west side of the airport. A T hanger is essentially a garage for an airplane. In terms of the service area, uh, the, the airport is the primary gen general aviation facility for the Dover area. Um, it is, and of course, there is a civilian component to the Dover Air Force Base, uh, but this is truly the, the accessible uh, general aviation facility for, for Central Delaware. I mean, you have Summit Air Park to the north and uh, Delaware Coastal and Sussex to the south, but for Dover, this is the primary facility that would be used. Uh, so any aircraft that does require more than 4,000 feet of runway would have to use Dover Air Force Base, Wilmington, Newcastle, or Delaware Coastal. Just real quickly looking at land use, these are things that we, we take a look at in terms of both land use and UC zoning. Uh, the good thing is those are pretty consistent with one another, which is which is a sign of good planning in, in the surrounding area. And we just we want to take these into consideration to make sure that if there's any areas of incompatible land use that we identify those. So now we move on to the forecast uh, of, of, for the airport. And what we did here is we looked at two different scenarios uh, because we've been hearing that there are a lot of uh, ambitious plans for Delaware State. We wanna make sure that this facility can grow and keep up with any of uh, the plans that Delaware State has. So if they do want to grow and expand their flight training program, we want to make sure that the airport is ready, able and willing to accommodate that which is why you see a baseline and an enhanced baseline. And the way that operations are categorized is itinerant, meaning it's aircraft that are arriving or departing the area. Local, meaning the airplanes that take off and stay within a 20 mile range. So that's a lot of flight training activity, which is why that local number is so high. Uh, military will occasionally use the airport for training, whether uh, with 
uh, aircraft like helicopters and such. And then we also broke out turbine operations, which is a, a propeller driven aircraft that's uh, turbine powered or a jet aircraft. And it's important to break out those operations because you want to know if we need to have additional facilities such as a jet fuel tank. Because right now only avgas, there's two types of fuel used in aviation. Uh, it's similar to auto where you have uh, regular gas or diesel or premium. Certain aircraft have different requirements. So by identifying the number of turbine operations, we know at, at what point we may need to have additional fueling facilities available. So as you can see, the enhanced baseline shows significantly more local operations. And so the enhanced baseline forecast represents the scenario in which uh, DSU has higher growth than anticipated. And that's uh, shown here in this graph here with the enhanced baseline forecast. In terms of aircraft, uh, this uh, we did a couple other scenarios here. We're under the baseline scenario, which grows from 28 aircraft, which are currently based at the airport, up to about 40. Uh, but if DSU does expand their flight program, uh, that could mean as much as 65 aircraft at the airport. And we do believe that under uh, higher growth scenarios, there could be some jets there. So the jet turbine growth is uh, additive to the, uh, it's a variation of the baseline forecast. So under that scenario, you could have as many as uh, probably three turbine or jet aircraft based at the airport uh, in the 20 year period. So in here we see a, a forecast summary, which is a comparison of the, uh, of the baseline forecast to what the FAA terminal area forecast is. So generally speaking, we are relatively consistent with the FAA's forecast that the TAF as shown is an FAA created forecast that is very much on the high level, but in the planning process, we have to be within 10 to 15% of their forecast to be considered valid. So our forecast is valid and, and checks out with the FAA's plans as well. Real quickly, we're going to go into an environmental overview. The environmental overview uh, is just that. It's an overview of the environmental features of the airport and of anything of significance. It does not satisfy the National Environmental Policy Act requirements for project construction. So that means that any project that is going to be developed out of this plan will sti still need to have an environmental uh, document produced, whether it be a category exclusion for minor projects or for more significant projects, it would be an environmental assessment. So there, this is just a high level overview of what some of the environmental features are that we need to consider. And the reason we do that is because we, we kind of want to know what the impacts are. So when we do our development plans and all alter, the alternatives, which we'll get into shortly, it's helpful to know where these issues are so we can avoid them or minimize them. We don't want to create a plan and then find out that there are wetlands there or there's another sensitive feature there that we could have made a different plan all along. So we take these into account early on to inform our decision making and, and make, make better choices in our development plan. And this will serve as the basis for that future NEPA document uh, and the permitting process. So these are all the categories that we just did a high level overview of. And these are all the elements that are in the National Envir uh, Environmental Policy Act. So as you can see, there are different features here uh, that are in the vicinity of the airport. And this, this, uh, the chapter will be available online for anybody that wants to read uh, this in greater detail. And you can see there are, we did, uh, this is a wetland delineation. You can see the picture is actually of the older airport uh, before the railway was constructed, but you can see there are some wetland features in, in areas to the west of the airport that will inform where we make our decisions in terms of longer term growth. So some of the key key findings, again, there's, there's areas of groundwater we need to be sensitive to and uh, wetlands that we need to be aware of in terms of how we actually will develop the airport. Other key areas, uh, the floodplains is not in the vicinity of the airport 
and the coastal resources um, area of concern ends uh, east of the airport, so that's not a concern for us, at least not for the next 50 to 100 years. Now moving on to facility requirements. Facility requirements is when we measure the, our existing conditions of our airfield and taxiway system against our future growth, what is it that we ultimately need? So these are the, all the different elements of the airport that we looked at on the air side and land side, and then even support facilities. So runway protection zones, this is an area off the ends of each of the runways. The FA typically will recommend that you have some type of land control underneath this area, whether you own it, whether you have an easement, something that will prohibit that, that gives you the control to make sure that nothing incompatible will end up in this area. Because this is the area right off the ends of each of the runways, they don't want things that are going to attract people. So we don't want schools, we don't want churches, we don't want uh, baseball fields that are going to have stands and have games in there. So I, basically the less people, the better for things like RPZs. So they want you to have the ability to have a control of those land uses so that something incompatible does not end up in that area. And in terms of hangars, the uh, under the baseline, enhanced baseline, you can see there's quite the difference in the forecast. So somewhere between seven units and 23 units of T hangars and between 10,000 square feet and 26,000 square feet of additional hangar space can be expected. Uh, for, the, for the most part, outside of DSU, most airplanes at the airport are based in hangars, whereas the, the fleet for DSU is predominantly parked on the apron outside. And uh, on that note, uh, the apron parking, which is where the aircraft that aren't in hangars park, there's two components to it because you want to make sure you can accommodate the itinerant arrivals. So this is aircraft that are coming in that aren't based at the airport, make sure they have a place to park, and then also have a plan to park the entire fleet for DSU and with what they need. So the itinerant design operation, obviously we're not gonna plan for NASCAR. Uh, that's what they say in planning as building a church for Easter Sunday. We don't wanna do that, um, but we do wanna keep in mind that what is a, a typical, uh, the they want us to use the average day of the busiest month as what is prudent for planning. So we're not we're not building out for the, the NASCAR weekend or any kind of major event in town. But we're planning for the average day of the busiest month. And you can see that we will need to plan for uh, an apron expansion. And that's actually a project that's currently already uh, designed and uh, funded for most of that project because we, we know it is something that we're going to need. As it relates to auto parking, uh, this is one of the areas where it's definitely deficient right now. Uh, if you go down there on any given day, it's not uncommon to see vehicles parked in the grass. Um, and that's much to do with the success of the Delaware State Aviation Program and the fact that uh, they have classes going on over there and there is a small number of parking spaces. So should the facility grow and expand even more, then we're definitely gonna need to have potentially over 100 new parking spaces at this airport. Fuel facilities, uh, like I said, there's 5,000 gallons of what's known as 100 low lead, which is the, the piston powered aircraft fuel, which is predominantly single engine aircraft. Uh, however, we do recommend that now that you have the 4,200 foot runway that is capable of jet and turbine powered propeller aircraft that use Jet A is that we recommend that there be some kind of jet a fuel tank installed at the airport um, this is a little bit difficult because it is a business decision that you need to have someone that operates it typically someone to uh, provide those services so there is a little bit of a chicken and the egg situation of, of with the jet fuel tank but because your facilities are designed and have the ability to accommodate that we want to make sure that we have the ability to um, make sure everyone's being admitted into the meeting. Uh, 
Uh, so we want to make sure we have the ability to provide services that are commensurate with our airfield facilities. So any questions on the facility needs so far? OK, so after we looked at our inventory of what we have, our forecast of what we need and the facility deficits, we look at different alternatives and some of these are different concepts. So we looked at air side and land side. We want to make sure that they meet the facility requirements. We want to minimize environmental impacts. We want to make sure we meet the FAA standards uh, sensitive to things like development costs and development flexibility and making sure that we're also protecting the room for future expansion and uh, operational efficiency. So as we talked about the Roy protection zones, uh, as of right now, on the east side of the airport, uh, the, the land is not fully owned by the DRBA, but this is currently under underway to acquire this through a project with DelDOT. So DelDOT is actively looking to acquire the parcel in green and will uh, therefore be able to provide um, through transfer to the airport now they will own the full RPZ. However, in planning for the future, we are looking at the larger sized RPZ, which is if there's a better approach into the airport. The Roy protection zone does get larger. This is a longer term vision for it. So this is something where because the parcel is available now, we are able to plan for longer term needs for the airport. So it's anticipated that the smaller RPZ it will likely be the Roy protection zone. And I'm not sure if you can see the cursor, but the smaller RPZ is the, the one inside of the larger one. That will likely be sufficient for probably the next 10 or 20 years, but we have the ability to uh, purchase larger elements of the parcel in green to plan for in the event that we do get a better approach into the airport, which is lower visibility minimums, and then would thereby, thereby have a larger roadway protection zone to plan for. So what we're doing now is we're planning for this larger RPZ in the event that it, it uh, comes to fruition later on. Therefore, we don't have to actually go through in that process again of acquiring additional land. We did look at a runway extension concept. This was looked previously under uh, under the initial uh, development plan for the airport. Uh, what looked like a 500 foot extension on the west side of the airport. The existing forecast does not support this concept at this time, uh, but we did want to show at least what it looked like because it had previously been considered. Um, should demand and activity at the airport change? Uh, this could be revisited, uh, but as of right now that it's not supported by the forecast. So now we looked at apron and fueling alternatives. So this is where you can fuel the aircraft and where you can park the aircraft. So this is a proposal that shows the uh, the apron expansion out in front of the existing terminal. And apron alternative two, which is more to the west of the existing terminal. And you can see the fuel farm being located uh, adjacent to the apron that allows the aircraft to to pull up to it and fuel themselves without having to have someone there staffed to to uh, fuel the aircraft for them. And that's an attractive feature to pilots because it allows them to come in at any time of day and get fuel whether there's someone on staff or not. And this is actually is the preferred alternative for the apron expansion. This is what's currently being designed and constructed uh, for the most part for the, the coming years. So we looked at additional hangars, uh, as we mentioned that there's between seven and uh, 23 units of additional T hangars. Those are the rectangle boxes. Typically speaking, those rectangle T hangars will have about eight or 10 bays in each of them. Uh, whereas the, the more square hangars are the conventional hangars, which will accommodate usually larger aircraft like a, like a by larger I mean a small twin engine airplane or a small jet aircraft can use those hangars 
and it could even be something like a paint shop or a maintenance operation uh, or a small business that has their own individual hangers. So, and then similarly, we looked at those hangers. Could they go further up or uh, east or west uh, at the airport? Uh, now, when it comes to Delaware State, this was particularly interesting because they've had uh, aggressive plans for expansion from our discussions with them. And it really came down to whether uh, the money was going to be available through the university or the state. And throughout the planning process, it wasn't abundantly clear if they were going to get a larger sum of money to build a robust new facility or if it's going to come in smaller pieces. So what you see here is more of a, a piecemeal type operation. If they got uh, could build a hangar, one or two hangars at a time and slowly expand their classroom. Whereas this alternative is if they have, if they got a lot more money and this would probably be a, a two story building here that would have classrooms and hangar space and allow them to have their own dedicated facility. It would no longer be a shared space with the, with the DRBA terminal building out front. So this would give them their entire dedicated classroom and flight training space to have their own program. Now, unfortunately, we don't know what the money situation holds for them because uh, that would be funded through the university. But we want to make sure that we could accommodate their plans for whichever road happened. And the beauty of it, if you look at all of the different scenarios that we have, is that everything basically fits. So rather than choose one scenario over another, we actually have the full recommended plan for the airport that includes a new, a brand new uh, full DSU facility, or if they end up having to incrementally grow around their existing apron and the existing terminal facility, uh, we're able to move the, the conventional hangars up a little bit. You can see the larger auto parking facility that we need as well as additional T hangers. So the recommended plan for the airport development wise, uh, while this looks rather robust, it allows us to accommodate whatever could happen. So we can now have an approach that allows us to um, offer the facility to anybody who comes to us. So if someone wants to come in and build a conventional hangar and, and offer a, a paint shop, okay, we'll pick what, which site do you want of the four conventional hangars. If we know we have additional robust uh, demand for T hangers, then okay, well, we can build more T hangers. We know exactly where they go. And whichever way DSU decides to grow, we have the, uh, the ability to accommodate them. So now as it relates to implementation and financial feasibility, uh, the capital improvement plan is relatively light, uh, but that's because we spent the past 15 to 20 years basically building the airport. So e even the FAA has kind of acknowledged that, okay, we gave, we've given you over $20 million to construct the brand new airport. Now it's on you to go and do the economic development and business development to, to get users to, to use the facility. So a, a polite way of saying you guys are done for a little while in terms of major capital investment especially now that the apron is underway. So as you can see here, the, the primary items we're looking at is making sure that we keep the approaches clear through removing obstructions. If there are improved approaches to the airport, sometimes that lowers the imaginary surfaces lower, which means that we have to remove trees. And of course, trees grow. So we want to make sure that the obstructions are always uh, clear so that they don't become a hazard for aircraft. Uh, and then there is an additional apron expansion in a later phase. And then longer term, it's really more demand driven projects. But who pays for these? Uh, it's predominantly as it relates to public funding. The FA will typically uh, fund about 90% of eligible projects. So pretty much any most of the projects that you see with the exception of hangars are eligible for uh, up to 90% federal funding. Uh, then 10% is funded through the Delaware Transportation Trust Fund and or the DRBA. And of course, if there's any other investments, things like private funding or other investment for things like DSU or additional hangers for things like the maintenance shop, for example. 
So with that, I um, want to open up to any questions or comments, but that is the an overview of the master plan and proposed plan for the Delaware Air Park. So just uh, if you are asking a question, just be aware you may be on mute. Uh, do you ever do you ever anticipate uh, any small commercial passenger aircraft coming in? I would not expect that type of service. Uh, the small commercial service aircraft that could use a facility like this would be nine seats or less. And typically you'll see those at boutique type of leisure markets. So think a place like Cape May or Ocean City or uh, like the East Hampton, New York, where there is a, a high end draw that you will attract a different clientele that will be willing to pay up to $400 for an airline ticket because the, the small aircraft are not usually uh, low fares if you're going to go up to Philadelphia and fly Spirit, for example, or come February flying Frontier out of Wilmington down to Florida is what you'll be able to do, but it's uh, the, it's not really a commercial service type market unless there was a special kind of connection where it would be attractive to a certain operator. So someone like Cape Air or Southern Air Express is going to want, there has to be something that's going to generate demand for someone to fly uh, up to 10 people every day back and forth to a certain city. Thank you. Good. Gave you a plug there, Steve, on your new air service come February at, uh, at ILG. Good, good, good. <laughs> so Rick, what about uh, the possibility of um, small package freighters, something like a caravan uh, that would move freight, uh, let's say for FedEx or UPS? What about that possibility? So as it relates to cargo, uh, cargo is an interesting thing in that, especially air cargo, is that the, if it's all things being equal, they would rather truck it. They don't want to fly it because it's so much more expensive to fly it than it is for someone to put it in a truck. So typically the rule of thumb is about three hours. So if you are more than three hours away and you have a certain level of demand, then you may see a caravan. But when you have airports like Baltimore and Philadelphia less than three hours away, it makes it much more economical for them. They can fly the airplane. It'll land at Philadelphia at five o'clock in the morning. And if there's priority overnight packages, it can still be in Dover by 8 a.m. So I, I think that it, it's, it's a limited market opportunity. Um, and of course, there usually involves a product. So if there's a product that being made there, so let's say that if a business moved to Dover and they were manufacturing a high-end product that was time sensitive, then the facilities at Dover could absolutely accommodate a caravan type aircraft. And we would then look at uh, a cargo apron to do that, but it would have to be something that is high dollar and time sensitive in order to make sense. Got it. Thank you. That's why you update these plans every 10 years or so, because let's say that does happen in the community. Now we would incorporate that as part of the plan. Uh, but we did reach out to different stakeholders, which included economic development and DelDOT. And that was not something that was brought up in terms of uh, a need for the area. But, but again, the reason why we update these plans is because if someone is successful in attracting a business that has that need, that we can update our plan to make sure we can always be aligned with what the community needs. Hey, hey this is Ryan Johnson with Advantech. You uh, you had mentioned Dell State possibly um, constructing a building to separate their aviation program from um, the conjoined building as is. Um, is that a part of the this project or would that be kind of a separate project with the university? Just trying to understand that that portion of it. That would be a totally separate project. So essentially what they want to do or what they want to build for for their program 
uh, is really up to whatever their needs are. It's the, the plan for the airport is positioning to make sure we can accommodate those needs. So whether they want to build a larger, robust facility or grow on to their existing one, uh, what our plan showed is that we could it can go either way. We have the room to accommodate either one of their needs. So it would essentially be driven from the university and okay. support and supported by the plan. OK, yeah, thank you. I, I didn't I wasn't sure if that was going to be funded as part of this project or if it was from Dell State separate. So thanks. Yeah. Now, the FAA, unfortunately, will not participate in a, in a program like that um, in terms of for funding. They, they tend to prioritize their fundings for things like runways and taxiways um, and equipment that supports operations and anything that is more revenue generating um, is not is not going to have a, meet the eligibility and thresholds necessary for FAA funding. So Rick, what's the next? What are next steps? If you have so the next step is if if there are any comments, uh, I will put this share the screen back up over here, and then you can see. So if there are any comments, uh, you can email any one of the project contacts. So uh, I'm Rick Lucas, the project manager for McFarland Johnson. We were the consultants that prepared this plan. Uh, worked along with uh, Greg Stehanoff from the. DRBA project manager on their end uh, from the engineering division, uh, Ben Clint Daniel, the manager of airports, and of course, uh, Steve Williams and Tom Cook are on the line as well. But any questions or comments can be emailed to us. This is kind of our, our last uh, outreach to the public before we've kind of finalized the plan. Like I said, we have had different stakeholder meetings over the course of this, so this plan was not developed in a vacuum. So we had, again, stakeholders from DelDOT and DSU uh, and economic development have all participated in our stakeholder meetings over the past year or so. So this this is kind of our what we're looking for is just making sure that if there's anything that we missed at this point or anything that wasn't considered uh, to please let us know at this time. And the next step is essentially we're going to do a draft submittal to the FAA and then once the airport layout plan is approved, then you are able to to use that to fund new projects as they come up. So Rick, is is there a deadline on when you would like those comments in by? Uh, let let's use the end of the year because we are we are wrapping up the chapters in the ALP and we're do we're we're starting to do our reviews on our end. So the quality assurance reviews are underway. Uh, the ALP development is underway. So um, by the end of the year, so if there's any comments, uh, get them into any one of the folks here that, that's shown. And then, uh, yeah, an end of the year for, for comments. Okay. All right, and then uh, is this, we, have, we recorded this meeting for anybody who could not attend or uh, was able to join us late, but this we can make this available through either the DRBA website or we can put it up somewhere. Uh, was the public yes, information? Yes, it'll likely be on likely be on our website. Our, our public information officers on, on the uh, okay. as well, um, and uh, it'll likely be on our website. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, so we can we can make it available. So I think is there a contact uh Jim Solomon, are you right? The Jim, PIO for Jim, DRBA? Jim Salmon is on the is on the call. Jim, can you I'm here. Okay. I'm here. I believe that content information was in the press release, if anyone has the press release if need be. So but anyone from the project team can direct you to the project website or the, the DRBA website if there's any questions for any comments. But again, this whole meeting was recorded for the presentation for anybody that missed information or wants to go back and hear more. Great. All right, any any further questions? All right. Hearing none, I appreciate your time and I appreciate the questions that we did get. Uh, this was a fun project for us to work on. 
for sure. So one one last thing. Uh, this is Ryan again. Um, I've, I've been a resident here in Kent County for pretty much my entire life, aside from schooling. Um, but one thing to consider may possibly be incorporating the state police and their their helicopter unit and training. Uh, I'm not sure where they currently do that, but that, that would be pretty neat to see. Steve or Ben, do you know where they currently operate? They have a facility at Georgetown Airport from what I, okay. uh, Ben, can you correct me if I'm wrong on that? Yeah, so their their northern division is based out of the Summit Airport and then Summit uh, Airport. southern okay. is Georgetown. So okay. the southern unit is Georgetown, okay. Got it. Okay. Yeah, actually, you are correct. I, I do recall seeing the facility at Georgetown. So uh, I guess the pro and con of being a small state is that 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 does provide very good coverage. But again, like we mentioned on the air cargo is if there was if they were looking to consolidate in a centralized location when we do update the plan or theoretically any one of those conventional hangars that are in our plan could easily be used for for their needs because those hangars are, are consistent with the size of a, a state police type helicopter program so it's as simple as saying all right we want one or two of the four conventional hangars on your airport layout plan and you're you can accommodate them thank you okay. all right so any other for comments otherwise uh thank you all for your time and participation in the, in the comments in the project and look forward to hearing any comments that you have i'm gonna go ahead and just put that screen up one more time just in case anybody needs to write something down in terms of email addresses. But with that, everyone is free to go. And again, sorry we couldn't do this in person. Uh, these are always typically fun when you get to talk about the project to various members of the community. So hopefully future projects will be back in person. But any questions, email us. And uh, thank you all. Have a good night. All right. Thank you, Rick. Thanks, Thanks Rick. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.